those dimensions, and you now have to get a special wide load or tall load or heavy load permit, which are extremely expensive. So most tiny home on wheels are built in a very specific form factor, which is extremely limiting when your entire width is eight feet. And you know when you factor in a couch, it, when you're sitting in it, it is three feet, and then you need space in front of it. So eight, eight, the, what you see on TV is actually a very extreme niche, which I don't think is applicable to hardly anyone, but it makes for good television, which, which is why you see so much of it. Um, timeline. Um, we found the land and put an offer in right before Thanksgiving. Um, there was 60 days of due, um, due diligence, which um, one of the biggest ones for our due diligence, I'll get this in a minute, is finding no deed restrictions, which are basically restrictions that previous owners of the land placed on the, placed on the land, which, de which is legally binding on what I can do with the land that I currently own. So a previous owner can dictate what you as the current owner can do with the land. Um, closed on the land in January, and um, by March had the driveway and foundation in. Um, our driveway is 12 feet wide by over 300 feet long, and because of budget reasons, we went with gravel. Um, we got close to 200 tons of gravel, which Fortunately for us, we are less than five miles from a um, concrete recycling plant, so we can get it for, if I remember right, it was $400 for a 20-ton load delivered, uh, which is an extremely good deal. Um, we had the driveway, uh, we had the drywall and paint done by July, and for most houses, um, the drywall, putting the drywall up is typically halfway through the building process, because the paint, the finishes, the floors, the cabinets, the fixtures, all that takes just as much time as it does to frame the house and put the exterior, put all the insulation. Um, we had to move in in July. When we moved in, we didn't have a functional kitchen, didn't have time, ran out of money. Um, bathroom, fortunately, did function. Um, ended up using a laundry sink as our kitchen sink, um, and we did have the stove and refrigerator, but no cabinets, no countertops. Um, and we did that for almost six months. Um, and then finally in January of 2008, our kitchen was installed and, uh, and we got it um, certified and permitted by the county. And, and they gave us our certificate of occupancy, which means we could finally gain insurance on the house. Um, insurance will not insure a house without a certificate of occupancy because, well, they need some insurance that you built it up to the local code. Um, finding the land was rather challenging. Um, the, the, you gotta, you got to locate it. you got to find the utilities and then the deeds and restrictions. Um, the, the utilities is a big one. And this is what a lot of people don't realize is um, where you put your house can dictate dramatically the cost of the utilities. In my case, I, I paid nothing to connect to Duke Power. I paid $1,000 to connect to um, the city water and paid 3000 for my septic. Now, if I had built in a place that was much further off the road, it could have been thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for just to bring the power in. Um, and so for me, there was no upfront cost because I had power right at my driveway. Um, so those utilities, um, finding a property with utilities readily available is a huge factor. Um, we happen to have 3.41 acres um, of mostly former farmland. Um, and the deeds and restrictive covenants is most deeds, um, if you find a, a, a deed or a covenant, basically it was put in by most likely a subdivision developer um, and they, they, they can state basically whatever they want. And um, back during the 50s, the covenants actually said that you know, this, white, this neighborhood is for white people only. Um, and that's how they kept segregation going. Um, the developers would put those rules in, and those were enforceable up until the 60s when that was deemed unconstitutional. But some of the restrictions you'll see is, you know, you must have 3,000 square feet of heated square footage. It must be two, um, two floors. It must have a drive, must have a garage. It must be brick. It must, 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 must. All of those musts can drive up the cost. So if you can find property without deed restrictions, you can now suddenly have the freedom to do what you want within the county's rules. 
And these deed restrictions are put there by a previous owner. And typically, a deed will specify how you remove it. And most are, you have to contact either the original deed, who, who wrote the deed, or their descendants. If that deed was put in 150 years ago, you have to find the living descendants of that person, and they have to agree for a new covenant to get one in place. Yes? So um, it is typically enforced by your neighbors. Um, and if your neighbors don't care, then yes. But if you built, knowing there was a deed restriction, and maybe you had neighbors who didn't care at the time, but a year or two down the road, you pissed them off, they, and they, they look at their covenants and go, uh-uh, you weren't supposed to build that. They can then sue you in court, in civil court, when, and you now have to make the modifications to bring up to the covenants. This is how HOAs get power, is through the covenants. Without a covenants, HOAs have no power. Um, and that's, I have a particular disdain for HOAs for, for this very reason. <laughs> um, so this is what the property looked like in December. Um, this is standing near the very back. Um, and um, up towards the middle is our, where the road and our driveway is. Um, we, have, we only had 50 foot of road frontage and our county required that we put in a 20 foot driveway. So where it met the road, we, it had to be 20 feet. And our county actually allowed us to do gravel all the way up to the road. Now, um, uh, this is what it looked like in February, and this is actually our um, grading contractor. He's the one who put in the driveway and the foundation. Um, and so that, that's the path of the driveway. Um, you can see my car parked um, up on the road, because you know, I obviously couldn't get it back there. Um, and that's what it looked like after he, so he scraped away the topsoil to get um, down to the bare clay. And um, I requested that he put in, it's called geotextile fabric. It's a very strong fabric that they put on top of the dirt, but below the stone. And it keeps the stone separated from the rock, or the, the dirt. Um, and he said that if I hadn't gone that way, he would have, he would have had about doubled the amount of stone because um, the mud was so squishy, it would have just been all compressed down into the mud. Um, and so this is, um, I laid this out on the house. Um, so this is the corner with our concrete stoop. Um, I later replaced that with a deck. Um, and the dimensions of the house is 22 feet wide by 20 feet deep. That is smaller than most people's garages. Um, and so um, one of the things I did um, is I went ahead and dug the trenches. Um, and um, this particular trench is for the water line running along the driveway. And while I had the trench open, I went ahead and put in conduit for, I got now a pole up by the driveway which has power and ethernet to it so I can run cameras, access points and whatnot. Yeah, I have an access point just for my yard. <laughs> um, so um, here I put, this is the foundation, um, the particular foundation that we chose um, mainly due to cost is, uh, it's called a monolithic slab. So the footer, which is the wide part which supports the weight of the walls, is in the same pore as the slab. Um, and so it's slab on grade. Um, it is about the cheapest way you can put in a foundation of this size. Um, and you'll notice the shipping container. Um, about, a few, about a week after this picture was taken, uh, the shipping container was broken into and I had about $2,000 worth of tools and materials stolen out of the container. Um, that, that event delayed the entire project by over a month because after that happened, I was unwilling to have over $10,000 worth of lumber and building materials delivered to the property without some type of assurance that this wouldn't happen again. Um, and so this is right here, this is, um, I basically jacked up the container because I had to level it. Um, those jacks each are capable of supporting 20 tons. They're called railroad jacks. They have a very small foot, so you can go underneath the container while it's still sitting on the ground, and I'll jack it up. Now, the container by itself is 8,000 pounds empty. Um, the container itself um, cost about 2,300 delivered, and that was at the time. So paying for a house like this, and this is something else that doesn't get very widely talked about, in the, especially in the tiny home shows. They almost never talk about financing. 
Um, and so they, they leave you with the impression that all these people have $80,000 cash to drop on a tiny home on wheels. Um, so a couple of different ways of paying it. Um, some of the big ones are obvious is cash, loans, and mortgage. Um, and other types of financing, that would be friends, family, or um, personal lines of credit. Um, I, paid for, I paid for the land cash. I paid for about half the building cash, and then I took a personal line of credit um, unsecured to pay for the rest of the building. Um, so this is what it looked like in March, and um, in the delay, I, um, I set up, and there'll be a picture of this later, I set up a um, solar panels to power a um, camera system that was installed inside the container. Um, and I had to go solar because I, um, I didn't have even a temporary power at this, comp at this time. The power company was running about eight weeks behind. So I was, to do the construction part, I was running on a generator. Um, but you obviously don't want to leave a generator running 24-7. So the cameras themselves, the, the cameras, the server, um, were um, all powered via a um, solar panel and a bank of batteries, and I'll have pictures of that. Um, when you lay out a driveway um, or anything, it's good to pay attention to slopes. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I didn't quite pay attention close enough. So I unfortunately put our driveway in at the lowest spot of the entire property. And this is after one of our nice um, afternoon showers where we get about an inch of rain in 30 minutes. Um, and that results about in six or eight inches of standing water. Um, that mistake cost me over $10,000 to fix later and extra um, trenching, grading, um, piping, and putting in a retaining pond. So some of these mistakes can really do cost you a lot of money. Um, so this is setting up for the um, putting the gable ends on the walls. Um, for mine, I went with um, the walls themselves are 10 feet, which is taller than a standard. Standard house is built with eight foot lumber. I built with 10 because being a smaller physical square foot, I wanted to give some more vertical to help make it feel better. And then in the um, main area where the kitchen and the living room are, um, I vaulted to 16 foot, so um, it would be taller than these ceilings. Um, and one thing, I, when you build a project like this, there's always the regrets of what you should have done. What I've sh so what you can see here is the two gable ends stacked on top. The front gable wind has the windows. I should have put a gable, I should have put windows on the back. I didn't. And now it's ungodly expensive to do it now, where then it would have cost less than 200 bucks. But now it's a couple of thousand to do it. Um, so this is what I was talking about with the solar panels. I did um, four solar panels at um, 250 watts each for a, for a total of 1,000 watts of solar, coupled with um, batteries that I got on a heck of a deal. Um, I got 32 batteries for less than 600 bucks, and they were still had factory warranty. Basically what happened was a local news station, their batteries had expired in their UPS, so they had a company come out and put new batteries in their UPS. Um, this is one of the, you know, powering a um, TV station. Um, six months after that, they, um, after the new batteries, they got new equipment, which made a new higher power demand, and so they had to get new batter, um, they had to get a new UPS. Um, and so the gentleman who installed the new UPS said it's a, it'd be a shame to have to scrap all these batteries since they were only six months old. So I got them for less than the scrap value. I, if I wanted to, I could have paid 600 to him, drove them to the scrapyard, and got 800 out of them. But I kept them. Um, total weight was about 3,000 pounds of batteries out on the 32 of them. Um, permitting. Um, we, we got a building permit from Spartanburg County, which is our jurisdiction. Um, when choosing a property, stay out of the city, city limits. Cities almost always impose restrictions on size, um, setbacks, um, and various things, which just makes building a lot more complicated and more expensive. So stay out of the city limits. Um, we had to get a DHEC septic permit, which is that's the South Carolina Department of um, Health and Environment something like that. Um, and they're the ones who they, um, in South Carolina, you're not required to get a perk test or a percolation test. Um, basically what they do is they come in with a hand, arg or hand um, core sampler. 
they sample down to 60 inches and lay the dirt out in a line as they find it. So you can see the different layers of the clay. And the guy would um, take the different layers, rub them between his fingers to find how gritty it was, compare the color to a book he has, and based on that information, goes, yep, you can put a septic tank here, it will work um, up to performance. So the, and, and states and jurisdictions that require a percolation test, that could be $1,000 because you have to bring someone out with a backhoe, you've got to dig a hole that's four foot, it's got to have a shelf um, to, so you can step up and out, it's got to be this wide, this deep, this high, so um, that's another thing to look at which will cause prices to, you know, the cost to drive up. Um, there's land use ordinances, so in our case there was very minimum, but they basically drill down to, you know, you can't build a house, you know, one foot away from your property line, you know, th th things like that, which having three and a half acres, you don't have a problem with. Um, and then you had to, we had to get a driveway access permit um, from the county. Um, and our, in our jurisdiction, in our area, the signs are marked with different logos. Um, It'll be the state crest or the county crest or even a city crest. And basically, whosoever crest that is, that's who owns and maintains that road. Thereby, that's who you have to get permission to put basically a driveway on that road. Um, and sometimes they can have um, Spartanburg required us to put in a 20-inch concrete culvert um, under our driveway. And it, they, it, they, it has to be concrete. It ha and it's got to be 20 feet long. So that these are various restrictions that the counties can put on, or state or city. Um, so this is what it looks like in April. Um, did it's got the sheathing, it's got the roof um, framed out, and um, there's a nice red clay mess all around, and we're still dealing with some of that now. Um, and here's just more framing. Again, this is what it looks like in April. Um, the scaffolding. So. Um, I should have did a little more research. When you rent scaffolding, they charge it's close to $100 a week. However, if you go, we got, the, we got this particular unit. Um, it is 16, um, sorry, it is 12 feet tall. Got it at Northern Tool for $500 for the entire set. Which, when I, I used the scaffolding for over three months. So, um, saved a ton of money by returning the rented scaffolding after a week and going buying the scaffolding. Um, here's with the roof sheathing on, um, and you can see our little storage closet on the back, which is where we keep the hot water heater. Um, we have a tankless hot water heater, which is plumbed in with propane. Um, we don't deal with, we don't have gas service at our house. One of the most frustrating things with building the house is dealing with contractors. And I, and um, the upstate of South Carolina, it is a very, um, um, the density of new houses is very high. They are, there, there's constant demand for new houses. And most contractors that are good are almost always busy, booked up months and months of advance. And when you have a smaller job, like, oh, we only need a 20 by 22 foot concrete slab poured, it's not worth it to them, for the most part, to come out and deal with it when they can, they, they can drop my job and go do another job that pays five times the money because it's five times as big. So dealing with contractors was extremely frustrating. And that is one of the things that drove me to do most of it by myself is because I couldn't get anyone to come out and do it. You know, I, even if I paid them, I couldn't get them. So, and, and even today when we're, we're thinking um, we're doing the plan to build the main house soon. And again, dealing with contractors and architects. Um, I was talking with an architect two weeks ago and they said, sure, we'll, we'll build your house, but it'll be in a year and a half when we can finally start on it. I mean, before they'll even commit to saying they'll build it, it's, you know, they'll put you on the schedule for a year and a half out. Um, so this is in May. Um, and moving time, moving into the house is less than 60 days away at this point. Um, you can see the bathroom is framed um, here on the upper picture, and the bedroom is framed on the lower picture, and above it is a loft. Um, I, when I first was planning it, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with the area above the bathroom. I wasn't sure if I was going vault to vault the ceilings or what, but um, after looking at the space, I realized that for only about you know, $300 in lumber, 
I could build me a loft that is that still has enough space where I can stand up in it. Um, we, we don't sleep up there. Um, we only use it for storage um, and a little bit extra lounge space. Also, when you talk to your permitting agent agency, uh, don't tell them that anyone sleeps up there because they uh, to get it inspected, you got to have a stairs that is three feet wide, um, which would take way too much space. So sometimes it's a gentle gentle lie to the agencies. Um, so this is after the Tyvexes was on and the door was installed. This was a very happy moment for me because at this point, it was water resistant. So it means the inside was mostly dry. And the biggest thing is it was now secure. It was now lockable, which was a big deal for us. Um, here's a little bit of the networking. Um, these are network cables I put in, the black ones being exterior grade ethernet, the blue ones being Cat6. Um, we have four cameras installed on the exterior, um, yeah, four, um, of the house, and they basically look on each side. There are no cameras inside. Um, and I put in a network drop about every place I could possibly think I could ever need a network drop. So there's one behind the TV, there's, there's um, two by the couch, there's one by the bed, there's, um, there's a bunch upstairs in the loft, um, there's even um, Ethernet installed into the ceiling so I can mount my access point. Um, and um, all of the wiring inside the cabinet is, uh, or inside the walls is stapled, um, just like you would do an electrical cable. Um, so this is the, um, we're still in Bay, and you can see the plumbing for the laundry. Um, we ended up going with a stacking washer and dryer. So even though we're in 440 square feet, we got a full-size washer dryer, we got a full-size dishwasher, we got a full-size sink, a full-size stove, and a full-size refrigerator. Um, and we still have a pretty uh, decent amount of kitchen space. Um, and given the, given it's only 440 square feet, I think it's amazing just how much kitchen we actually did manage to squeeze out of it. Um, for the plumbing, I went with all PEX because it is a lot easier than soldering copper. Um, and PEX is extremely durable. Um, and when it freezes, it does not burst because there's a little bit of give in that plastic pipe. So it will expand and not bust. Um, which can be a huge help if you run um, um, water lines underneath. Yes, they will freeze, you will lose water, but you will not have a giant repair bill because you had water spraying all over your house. Um, one of the mistakes I made, um, and my inspector was so helpful in painting, pointing it out, was um, you, were, you were required 18 inches from where you put in the um, the water, the drain line from the clothes washer, you have 18 inches from that point to the uh, trap at the bottom. Because they f um, a washing machine can um, force water out so fast that if you don't have those 18 inches, water will come spilling out. And so I didn't realize that at first, and I put it up higher, and I ended up having to cut out work and redo it to get it lower to pass code. Um, and um, again, there was multiple inspection points. There was an inspection of the before report concrete. Um, I had to get a termite um, company to come in and put down a um, termite repellent underneath the concrete slab. And I had to have a certificate from the termite company to show the inspector that that, app that product was applied and what product it was, because it, that product itself was being a, would, would had to be approved by the county. Um, there was an inspection of the concrete slab after it was poured. It was an um, inspection of the framing. There was an inspection of the wiring. There was an inspection of the plumbing. There was an um, inspection of the insulation. There was an inspection when you were finished. There was an inspection of the roof. And all these inspections have to be scheduled. And you require at least 48 hours notice before they show up. My problem is, is I would have to schedule these during the work day, and they don't call you to give you notice that you're coming. Um, and so, and they have to have free access um, to the structure to be able to do these inspections. So doing the logistics of getting to meeting the inspector during business hours was challenging, to say the least. Utilities, we have city water, grid power, coax internet from charter, and a septic tank. Um, again, I, I already told you that um, we went with grid, grid power, because we paid nothing up front for it. Yes, we do have a power bill, but um, in order to go off the grid is A, you have to change how you live your life. No air, um, no air conditioning, 
Um, no um, big propane tank, and propane tanks or propane is extremely expensive. It's three something dollars a gallon, and when you have a thousand thousand um, gallon tank, it's rather expensive to get it filled. Um, or for the salt, or if you do want to go off grid and keep having your normal things like your dryer, your stove, your dishwasher, your air conditioning, you have to spend a ton of money up front to gain the inverters, the solar panels, and the batteries, and the batteries don't last forever. They last for five to 10 years. Um, so it's spend 50,000, 60,000 up front, or pay you know, 50, 60 bucks a month for my power bill. I pay for the power bill. Um, and for the wet, um, we had the choice of a well or a, or a city water connection. The city water connection is, uh, was $1,000, and it's guaranteed that I will get water after I pay for that. With a well, you're not guaranteed anything. They can come drill, and they can drill, 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 and never find water. And so you have, and you pay them for every foot they drill. And if they don't find water, they have to go to another location and drill, 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 drill. And so you can, um, you can the, the, about the minimum that I've read was about 5,000 for a well. Um, and it can go all the way up to 20, 30,000, depends on how deep they have to go. Um, what type of conditions do they find? Um, if it's real loose rock, they may have to put in a con um, they have to, may have to put in a steel sleeve, which then you're paying per foot. So in our case, city water was the most cost-effective solution. And when I chose the property, I made sure that I would be able to get real internet. Um, and so right um, right by our driveway, there was a nice charter line that ran on the power lines. So I knew um, immediately that I would be able to get real internet. Not, not that satellite internet. Um, so this is what it looked like in June. We went with a metal roof. Um, I like the look and it's also extremely durable. Um, that particular metal roof has a class four hail ring, which means it can withstand a two inch hailstone without breaking. Um, one thing that's interesting about metal roofs is after a hailstorm, it may be dented but your insurance will not pay to replace it because it's not structurally damaged. It's only visually damaged. Unlike with an asphalt shingle roof, it is structurally damaged after a hail storm, but not a metal roof. Um, the metal roof should be good for close to 100 years. Um, and then the siding, I went with hardy board cement board. Um, you don't have to paint it, it doesn't rot, it doesn't decay, almost effectively zero maintenance. Um, and then for the trim, I went with PVC or metal. I have no exposed wood. I have nothing to paint, ever. All of it has factory images. I wanted something that I did not have to do maintenance on, ever. Um, and the cable you see that's going across is um, going between the house and the container, and that's, that's holding up Ethernet so that I could have a camera on the front door of the house and it be recorded and powered from the container. Um, I did all the electrical. Um, here, um, I made a mistake and I should have went with a bigger panel. Um, it's very cramped in that panel and that panel is now full. It's a 200 amp service um, from Duke and uh, you can see all the wires that we ran in the ceiling. Running in a, such a square, such a small square footage means everything is real dense. There's a lot of wires in a very small area and because in a lot of the um, the city codes and the, um, the, perm, um, the National Electric Code states that you must have certain things be met. First is um, all those breakers with the white labels, those are arc fault, ground fault, which are required in bath anywhere where an outlet is near water, like a bathroom or kitchen, and um, that's the GFCI, and the arc fault is required in any place someone would sleep, so living room and bedrooms. An arc fault is basically if you screw in a nail, or something like that that does not um, short it, but maybe causes a little bit of arcing, it'll, it'll trip the breaker. Basically what it does is it looks at the sine wave of the power that's, that's going out to the outlet and back the breaker is, and it's analyzing it, and it, if it's out of tolerance, it'll cut it off. Same with G GFCI. It sends power down the positive. If the, if the same amount of power does not return on the neutral, power is leaking somewhere and so the ground fault would trip. Um, those breakers are 60 bucks a pop. So when you have to have six in our case, I didn't, I didn't quite understand just how expensive those breakers were. That was a bit of a shock when I had to go buy that many. 
Um, and the National Electric Code also demands that even though we had a small kitchen, we had to have two separate circuits, each at 20 amps. So, um, and same thing in the bathroom, you had to have a 20 amp breaker in the bathroom because of hair dryers and other things. So the National Electric Code, you have to understand the codes um, enough to s pick out the highlights of what, apl what is applicable to you. Um, and this is what it looked like in June. We are less, um, this picture was taken less than two weeks before we moved in. Um, we cut it extremely close and was very stressful. And our wedding reception was right around the same point because we were crazy. Um, this is what it looked like, in, same thing in June, with more insulation and the bathroom installed. We went with a uh, four-piece bathroom surround with the bathtub being extra deep. Um, and um, after living with that window, I would highly recommend if you can ever put a window in the bathroom, particularly in the shower area, it's very nice in the morning to have that natural light. I, I, I really do like that. Um, and this is what it looked like pretty close to moving. We didn't, have all the we didn't have all the siding done, we didn't have the fascia done, we didn't have the soffits done, but we had air conditioning. Um, we went with a mini split, um, it's 18,000 BTUs, um, which is roughly a ton and a half, and I installed that. I did have to contract a company, um, an HVAC company, to come and solder the lines and pull a vacuum um, before the Freon could be released. Um, and this is the drywalling another company did. Drywall, getting drywall right is an art. And anyone who's done it knows just how difficult it is. And unfortunately, our drywall contractor wasn't all that good. And we ended up with a pretty crappy product, which is going to cost us when we do have to go fix it later. Um, and um, here's painting. My God, I didn't realize how much I hated painting until I had to paint this place. That is one thing I wish I could have paid someone else to do. Um, being 16-foot vaulted ceilings was real fun to paint. Um, doing that much trim work and that much detail, I don't have the patience or the skills for that. Um, and I'd rather I would, I, sh I wish I could have paid someone else to do it, but at the time money was extremely tight, um, so that wasn't an option. Um, this was a glorious day, I tell you. Um, finally getting the permanent power installed to the house. I could turn on that air conditioning unit. Um, again, this was July. It was a very hot, muggy July. Um, and once we got that air conditioning turned on, it ran for a very long time. It felt good. Um, and so this is right around the time we moved in. Um, you can see um, no landscaping was done. We got the propane tank installed. Um, there was some siding that wasn't done and the porch wasn't done. Um, we were never, and this is after we moved in, we had never thought about putting a porch. Um, I'm glad we did. It looks, the house looks a lot better now that with it. Um, but the reason we ended up having to put the porches in is because before the drywall went up, we had a, we had a bad afternoon storm, real strong winds. And I was inside the house and I could watch this front wall, because it's 16 foot tall, it was flexing in and out it, by over an inch. And I was like, oh crap, that's not good. So um, I was like, how can I reinforce this wall um, and, not, and do the least amount of undo of my current work? And there's all types of bracing, all types of steel that you can do inside, but all of that has consequences with the finishes and cost and delay. So I was like, oh, I'll do a porch. And so while, before I put the siding up, I put the header up. Um, and basically, it's, it's already pre-screwed. It's already drilled into the wall. And there were, um, when we first tried to get insurance on the place, um, after we'd already passed the certificate of occupancy, so the county passed it like this. They were fine with it. They didn't care about this. The insurance company came around. They sent an agent out, and they said, oh, this house ain't finished. We're canceling your policy. You have a week. Um, and so I scrambled, and I eventually found State Farm. There was a local insurance adjuster um, who I showed the pictures to, and I explained the situation. He goes, oh, yeah, I can write a policy for that. Here you go. And less, less than an hour turnaround, I had a new homeowner's policy um, because I... After spending $30,000, $30,000, $40,000 on this, 
my nightmare the entire time was I'm going to come home and I'm going to come to this structure and there's going to be nothing left because it burned down and I'm out all of that money. So um, I did go with the homeowner's insurance policy. It was actually it was pretty cheap. Um, so we're now in October. So we've been in the house for a while um, due to finance finances. I um, a lot of these projects on the outside had to wait um, until I could rebuild the cash to be able to pay for all this because uh, I had maxed out um, the line of credit at this point. Um, so you can see that the AC lines aren't covered, the, the, the boxing, the frame for the fascia and the soffit is finished, and um, here you can see with it all wrapped in metal. So again, there was no exposed wood. Um, and yeah, it's a mess. It was a mess. Um, so much mud in the house from the dogs. Um, so this is in November. Um, we had originally went with the laminate flooring. I will warn you, the inexpensive laminate flooring that you find for less than a dollar a square foot is absolutely utter shit when it comes to water. Um, within one month, we had the laminate flooring around the front door was swelling. Um, and bubbling and rippling. And so I had to bite the bullet and I had to rip all of it up. Um, and um, here you see we chose um, to go with a um, garage epoxy paint directly on the concrete. Um, the gloss didn't hold up as well as I would hoped. Um, it's, it's now matted um, as time's gone on. But it, it's real difficult to grasp what had to happen to take the, to do this. I had to move all the kitchen contents out and put them where? Well, they all got stacked in the living room and around the bed. And so for, for a while, the, for the setup and the drying of this, we were, it was extremely cramped. Um, so this is what it looks like after the kitchen got installed. This was a happy day to finally have this. Uh, you can see our stacking washer and dryer, our kitchen cabinets, and that island was actually an interesting find. Um, Costco was selling those for 200 bucks as a workbench for a garage. I'm going, this is too freaking nice to be in a garage. It's got a nice wood top and big, heavy steel frame. That, um, so that became our island because the space is being an L, it's, it's rather big and, and um, the island helps tie it all in together. And again, all the appliances are standard full size residential appliances. There's no special tiny, tiny things. Because I actually do enjoy cooking. And so um, I needed the full-size appliances. And uh, I love the subway tile um, backsplash on the, in the kitchen. Um, and now, and this is January 2008, and I can finally start doing some of the exterior work. Um, and I did not want any shrubs or wooden mulch up against the house. Wooden mulch up against the house attracts termites, um, and the shrubbery itself can, um, um, because it's shading, it can cause uh, mildew and stuff like that to grow on the siding. And also, again, being terrified of fires and being have a giant grass meadow, which burns really easily, I wanted to have a non-burnable buffer. So I have a four-foot buffer of rock all around the entire exterior of the house to serve as a little bit of a buffer. Um, and this is part of the um, fixing the mistake of the drainage. Um, I had to put in a retaining wall, uh, which you see on the side of the house. I had to put in over 600 feet of piping to help direct the water um, away from the house and um, away from the driveway. Um, and here is building the porch. Um, I way oversized the lumber. I went with eight by eight pressure treated wood, which is just ungodly huge. Um, in reality, I probably could have got away with um, four by sixes. Um, and so this is what the deck looked like after, well, mostly finished. Um, ended up going with a composite wood decking. So it is actually um, recycled plastic and recycled sawdust that they form and pressed, it does not rot, you do not have to paint it, and um, it's virtually maintenance free, and it's got a nice hidden fastener system, uh, but it's not cheap. And this is, again, June, so we've been in the house for pushing a year now, and we finally get to finishing the loft. Um, finding a way up the loft was rather interesting. 
um, because I wanted something that was out of the way. Um, and um, there was, you know, of course, you could have looked at building something or having something custom built. Um, Allison actually ended up finding this ladder from Warner. It's it meant it's meant to put in a old house. Uh, it's all, it's a um, attic access ladder, but it's what's cool about it. It doesn't fold out. It slides up, and um, it's narrow, um, so it doesn't take up a lot of space. And got it for less than two hundred bucks. So. Um, and then for the railing, we did wire. This is an utter mess. This has been cleaned up now. Um, so remember those batteries I was talking about earlier? There they are. Um, there's some of the batteries. Um, I ended up doing a whole house UPS, um, and it backs up my refrigerator, the lights, the AV equipment, the controller for the tankless hot water heater um, for about eight hours. Um, and the switch is fast enough that computers don't realize that um, it's um, under five milliseconds, so the computers are fine with it. Um, but yeah, that, that has been fixed. Um, so this is, what it, this is what it looked like in August. Um, finally got the window trim done. Um, the, the, we lived for close to a year without window trim, or without the trim around the windows. And it does make it look a lot more complete getting the window trim. And so th there's our bedroom. You can see it's on the other side of the couch. Um, and we also made a run to Ikea and got, got some furniture. And Ikea is great because they actually do make furniture for smaller spaces. Um, and this is what it looks like today. Um, I am slowly trying to replace our grass with something non-grass. So right now we have 16 apple trees, two pear trees, five pecans, six grapes, bun, um, probably 20 berry bushes, um, and, a, and a garden that's in the back that's about 10,000 square feet. It's 100 by 100. So it is 20 times the size of my house. I know. I'm crazy. But we'll have a lot of corn and watermelon this year. Um, and, I'm and between the trees, again, I don't want the grass, so I've been replacing it with um, wood chips and perennial flowers. So total cost, the land was 27500 for 3.41 acres of glorious Spartanburg County. Um, I am only five minutes from 85. Um, everything else, the house the, and all the construction costs 50000 So total in, we're at uh, $77,000. Um, which is what we were appraised for. I think the appraisal is a little wrong because um, how they appraise a house is they compare it to comparable houses on the market at the time. And so they compared us to two houses. One house was built in 1928 and was 1,100, or no, it was 900 square feet um, in a really rural area, um, even rural than us. And the other house was built in the 40s and was 1,100 square feet. When you try to appraise a 440 square foot house, there's not many comparables. But we were appraised at 77,000. I think it's actually more than that. Future plans. Um, so again, we have the three and a half acres. Um, we are we have started. Um, I've I've done the building, and I know I don't want to build the main house myself because I know how much work that is. Um, so we are contracting that out, um, and we started that process, and we hope to start construction this time next year. The beauty with having this studio now on the same property is we can put it up for rent. Being only five minutes away from two major hospitals that employ a lot of traveling nurses, traveling nurses get a disposable per diem income for housing that in most cases is well over $2,000 a month. So I will be able to rent my fully furnished, all utilities included, um, all the way down to the linens and dishes furnished for about $1,600 a month, which will more than cover the mortgage for the main house. So within five years, I should be debt-free, mortgage-free, rent-free, and own my house and have $1,600 a month in income to pay for everything else. Woo. Uh, so here's more information, how to contact me. Um, when this video is posted to YouTube, I will also post that link um, to that Google, um, the photos um, folder which has um, 300 plus photos of the entire process. Yes? 
I was fortunate that they, they did not adopt new codes while the process was going on. Typically, a building permit is issued for a, a year duration, and um, you're typically locked into the codes that were applicable when you applied for, or when you were issued your permit. To. So if halfway through the building process, if you're still within that year, they changed, they went to an updated, like a new electrical code, you were still backdated because you got your building permit before that. I'll come to you a second. Yes. So did you, where did you get, how did you do the plans? Did you find them online? So I didn't find the plans myself. Um, I did look at a ton of plans to get a layout. Um, I um, purchased a software um, called um, Home Designer. Um, it is for Windows. Um, it was about 120 bucks, but it allowed me to draw out the walls, place the different stuff within the, within the structure so I can see, all right, yes, a queen bed is going to fit here with two feet of space on either side. Yes? Uh, those are my neighbors, um, and if you go to the craft um, tea share, we brought some of his honey to share with everyone. He, he's got about 80 hives. He gets about 200 gallons a year and sells it for about $10,000 a year, so not bad for a hobby. So I would probably not have been able to get a contractor to build a house this small, um, and... Um, so I would have had to go into a bigger house. A bigger house um, without land would probably be pushing 100,000. Um, so 120 something with the land. But I would have ended up with a bigger house, much more than I wanted. And so about the only way I could truly get what I want was doing it myself. Price um, and for, and this is also a very small space. Um, so I knew that gigabit Ethernet would be fine, probably for the life of the house. Um, again, it's 440 square feet. Um, probably in the future, it's only going to have an access point. I mean, especially after I rent it out, the, none of the renters are going to be plugging something in. In the main house, I will be putting ether. Uh, I will be putting conduit in because I'll be running fiber to. Um, various locations where I want more than one gig. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't run any coax um, because I knew I'd never be subscribing to cable TV service, so I, I didn't bother running coax inside. Yeah. Yes. Finding, finding the actual codes is extremely difficult. Um, so there starts, um, all the codes start at the national level, and then each jurisdiction will modify them. So there's the national building codes, then there's the South Carolina building codes, which they'll take the national codes and go, these, these things are not applicable, we're removing them, but these are applicable, so we're gonna add new rules. Then the county can add new, can also change the codes, and the city can change the codes. I was fortunate, I wasn't in city limits, and my county did not change the rules. They, adopt, they straight adopted it from the state. However, to get the actual text of the codes, even in an electronic format, would, would be over $200 per code. So that's $200 for the plumbing code. That was $200 for the electric code. That was $200 for the, for the framing code. So there are... Um, sections of the code in various places where people use them as citations. Um, but honestly, where I got most of this was, I loved this old house growing up, and I watched, I've been watching this old house probably since 95 and seen pretty much every episode. And so a lot of it was just learned knowledge um, about, you know, that walls are 16, um, 16 inches on center, outlets are, I think it's 16 inches high off the ground, Outlets have to be every six feet, you know, or every 12 feet. And, you know, a lot, a lot of them was just learned knowledge over time because I couldn't, I could not access the codes even if I wanted to because I was certainly wasn't going to pay $200 to get access to a PDF. Yes? The cameras I use are the Ubiquiti, which are 
These are actually my home surveillance cameras that I brought with me. Um, I am falling out of love with the Ubiquiti cameras. Um, I think they were good at the time when I, um, when I got them, but there are better, cheaper options now. If you find an MBR software that you like, um, I'm testing a new one that's open source, then once you go to a non-vendor MBR, you can, you can gain access to a huge plethora of uh, cameras. Um, the one I'm finding right now that I like is, it's like HIK something else. Um, 150 bucks for a outdoor PoE camera that's got five or six times the IR range that these cameras have for only $20 more. Because th these cameras are 130 bucks, which I think is outrageous for what you get for them. And so I'm moving away from them to something else. Very, actually very little. I would do the odds and ends project with my dad, um, but again, most of it was just watching this old house, which I can't say how much I love this old house. <laughs> Did you have another one? Oh, I have a similar question. Was like, you did most of the framing yourself. I did all the framing. So, how, like, how, was it just you, or how, how many people did it take? So, um, I was there on site every day that any work was getting done. Um, I did have my father to help and a um, family friend um, help. Um, mainly, it was mainly with the physical labor. Um, cause stand, standing up a 20 foot wall that's 10 feet high, it's, there's a lot of weight and it's, it's, it's impractical to do it by yourself. So I did have some physical help. A little bit from the father-in-law, from the wife. <laughs> So most, I'm fortunate that my father did have a lot of tools, and I basically cleaned his garage out of tools. Um, and as time has gone on and I've gotten more financial resources, I have replaced his tools with my own and returned his back. So yeah, there's, I mean, other than a um, sliding miter saw uh, uh, and a drill, um, those, those were the two main things that came in use for the tools. Um, so I'm actually giving a presentation on home automation where I'll go all into the home automation aspects. Um, that talk is tomorrow, I believe, in this room. Go ahead. Um, now that you've done this, you're talking about another house. Will you do the same thing? Um, on the main house, no. Um, but our, our property is zoned for, we can put 2.5 homes per acre freestanding homes on our house. We have three, we got three and a half acres. So we, in theory, could put almost 11 homes on it. So um, after I build this studio, or after I build the main house, um, I have been discussing about building a second studio on the property for rental purposes. Yes, Jess? Now that you've lived here for a year, how do you like it? I like the house yeah, it, it's quite cozy, and, and as the building inspector must say, y'all must really love each other. <laughs> so um, I paid cash for the property. Um, I then got a personal line of credit. Um, the personal line of credits are, the, the interest they charge is just downright um, extortion. It was 12% interest. Um, the advantage with a, a personal line of credit is you don't have to secure it with anything and the, it's like a credit card so that the monthly payments is proportional to the amount of debt. Um, as soon as I got the building inspected and insured, I refinanced it into a home equity loan um, at 6% um, and moved all the debt out of the home equity loan and into the, or sorry, out of the personal line of credit and into the home equity loan, thereby dramatically lowering the interest. Do you have to, well, like, how many hours do you spend a day? Do you have to, like, take off four days? I, um, so I worked it out with my employer that I would work four days, 10 hours each. Um, I, would, I, I would get off work at six. I would go, go to the building site, work until about 10, drive an hour to the apartment, get home about 11 o'clock, and turn around and wake up at 6 a.m. to go to work. 
Uh, I did this for three months, and it was extremely exhausting. And, and I, took Friday, Saturday, uh, I took Friday off, and I worked all day, sun up to sunrise, or sun up to sunset, um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and managed from, from the time when the first stick of lumber went on to we moved in was four months. Yeah, I know. Uh, I was crazy. I didn't, realize, I didn't quite realize what I signed up for until it was too late. So the insulation, um, I wish I could have done better, and I, I know a lot more about insulation now than I did then. Um, I did go with um, fiberglass. Um, your standard and required in our area is an R13 bat and a 2x4. Um, that's the minimum. Um, I did find a vendor that had an R15 with it that could still fit in a 2x4 bay. So I ended up, um, it is from a, um, Johnson Manning, I think it's the company. Um, turns out they actually manufactured it only, only a few miles from the house. Is that all the questions? So the... Um, the power bill would come in at about 60 a month. Um, propane we fill once a year, um, about every eight months. Between every eight months to a year, when we fill it, it's about 300. Um, the water bill is bi-monthly, so it's about $30 a month and like 45 or 50 for the internet. So overall, it's pretty reasonable. Um, so the propane is only for the tankless hot water heater. Yep. Um, and one big misnomer with tankless hot water heater, it's not instant, but it is unlimited. Um, the way I say it's not instant is because you do still have to remove the cold water that's in the pipe before the hot water arrives. Um, but you can truly run it forever um, as long as you have propane. Um, one thing, when we first moved in, we, um, I like a nice hot shower, so I bumped the hot water heater up from its default 120 to 130, made for very comfortable showers, but we were burning propane faster than I ever thought. Um, I was like, what's going on? And we now keep the hot water at 114, um, and we went from having to fill the tank every three months to every 12 months, just by turning it down. There is, but it requires um, 140 amps of power. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I mean, basically you have to have a 200 amp service, and then it uses, it, it uses um, 40 amp breakers, and it will use three to four of these 40 amp breakers. And you, it's, it's through the roof. And, and the tankless hot water heater, um, we went with a medium efficiency. It, it's rated at 9.8 gallons per minute. Your average shower is only three gallons a minute. So it, it, we can basically run everything in the house with hot water and still have plenty left over. I way oversized it. That was my mistake. It only costs about a grand. In, in hindsight, we could actually gotten away with about a $300 tankless um, going down with a smaller unit. Yes? So we went, um, our tankless, um, or not tankless, it's a mini split, 18,000 BTUs, heat and cool, heat pump. It will, um, it will produce heat with a temperature as low outside of five degrees. Um, it will, so it will be able to maintain the inside at seven degrees while the outside is five degrees, and that's heat pump only. Um, the, the particular unit we chose, it was a mistake. Um, it will only produce cold or cold air down to 58 degrees outside, um, we paid about 1600 for the unit. There are newer units, there are other units that will produce cold air down to five degrees Fahrenheit. All right, one last question, anyone? I, yes.